All right, what's going on, Laker fans? Thank you very much for tuning in on this Sunday. I know everybody's getting ready for some, uh, yeah, a little bit of NFL football. You got the AFC Championship, you got the NFC Championship. But before we do so, as promised, I mentioned uh, Hoops Talk Weekly. This is episode number three. I got a very, very uh, special guest. Uh, I know a lot of you guys probably know exactly who I'm talking about. I want to welcome in legendary broadcaster, the coach, John Cantera, to the show. Coach, thank you very much for the time, my brother. How are you? I'm doing well, Alan. Uh, great to catch up with you, and thanks so much for the opportunity to talk a little uh, basketball. And, uh, man, that Laker game last night was something special. It's pretty good, right? Pretty good. I, it's 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 funny, Coach, because a number of things I want to get into with you, but winning by one point and losing by one point, Everyone would be complaining today and last night if they lost that game. But the fact that they won it uh, obviously changes kind of the mood here on a Sunday. Um, OK, so I want to I want to start off with this. We're going to get to Lakers basketball in just a second. But you and I have an interesting relationship because um, we've known each other for a long time. I grew up in San Diego. Obviously, your ties to the city of San Diego, um, longtime resident in SD. But. I go back even before you and I crossed paths working together at uh, uh, at the Mighty 1090. I used to listen to you back in the extra sports days. And for those who know extra sports, um, it was basically the the uh, it was the speaker for Southern California. It was the speaker for all the sports in Southern California for a number of years. Coach, I used to call into your show. You used to do shows following some of these Laker playoff games. I remember specifically, it's the Shaq and Kobe days. And I used to call in, just sit there, patiently wait. I'm like, maybe coach is going to take my call. Maybe he's not. Of course, you would take my call. I'm like 15, 16 years old. So um, you, you've got so much history around the game and uh, really around all the sports. Would you mind just telling a little bit of your background, how you got into sports talk radio, and your affiliation? Because I know you've been a Laker fan for a number of years how that came about as well. Well, a lot to, to chew on there, Alan. Well, I, I grew up in, in Solana Beach, uh, played at Torrey Pines High School, had a great uh, high school career, basketball, baseball, played football as well, went to junior college, Maricosta. I played both basketball and baseball there. I uh, uh, had a, a great uh, couple of years. In fact, my sophomore year, I was voted the athlete of the year in the college. I had 35 mm -hmm. different scholarship offers coming out of junior college. Uh, some for basketball, some for baseball. I decided to go to USIU, United States International University, because uh, they were the one school that was going to allow me to play both sports. So I, I went there and uh, played pretty well my junior year, but I tore my patella tendon and I couldn't play baseball in the spring. And my old high school coach saw me at a car wash, believe it or not, uh, in the spring of 1979 and said, hey, I heard you got hurt. You can't play this uh, spring. Would you like to come out and coach? And that was kind of the start of my, my coaching career. And uh, I had a great uh, coaching career, Alan. I um, uh, coached three years at Torrey Pines while I was getting my California State teaching credential. By the time I got my credential, I'd already gotten an assistance job back with my old college coach, John Seeley at Maricosta. Spent three years there. Uh, spent one year at Southwestern in 85. We had a heck of a team. We won the conference title, set the school record for wins. I got hired at Texas Tech University. Uh, went in there the year before I got there that set the school record for losses. Uh, one year that I was there, we set the school record for wins. I think wow. uh, there were a combination, a lot of things. I, I brought my number one pitcher from Southwestern with me. I brought a shortstop from Mesa College in San Diego, Dave Geck, who's now a, uh, an education uh He's actually a principal at, uh, I think, at a junior high in San Diego. And I also brought a catcher that had transferred from Grand Canyon that I was uh, coaching in the summer when I was uh, coaching in Red Oak, Iowa, in the Jayhawk League. And so I brought a catcher, a shortstop, and a, a pitcher. And we had some good players anyways. And so we had a good year. But what happened was, and this is what, what led me to get into radio, uh, the head coach and the athletic director didn't get along very well. And he got fired. And I did get rehired. I was the only assistant rehired by Larry Hayes, who went on to have a heck of a career at Texas Tech and a uh, marvelous guy. And I stayed about six months and realized it probably wasn't the direction I wanted to go long term. So I decided to come back. Didn't have a job, Alan. This was in the spring of 1987. In fact, it wasn't even the spring. It was like uh, late February. And my old high school coach, Frank Chambliss, 
who had coached me uh, as a junior in high school and been the assistant at Maricosta one of my years, said, hey, there's a guy that would like to talk to you. And I go, who's that? He goes, a guy named John Lynch. I go, what does he do? He goes, well, he owns 17 radio stations. So I uh, got a hold of Mr. Lynch. Uh, really, the, the crux of it, he wanted me to coach his son, John Lynch, who later today is uh, obviously the general manager now of the San Francisco 49ers. Got a big I, game I coming up today. Oh, absolutely. And I'll text Johnny about 2.30. I have a ritual ever since he took over as a general manager. I text him about an hour to an hour and a half prior to every game. Wish him good luck. And believe it or not, awesome. as busy as he is, he always, he always mm. gets back to me with a little note back to me. Uh, so anyways, that was 1987. Uh, before long, they had me coaching four teams in three different sports at Torrey while I was working in the radio business. I wasn't doing a whole lot on the air back then. Just a little bit on the uh, Bloom and Harrigan show when 690 uh, Extra Gold was a, uh, uh, an oldie station. In fact, in the afternoon, they had Wolfman Jack on it. Mm. And, and Lee Hamilton came on, and he was really the first guy on 690 to talk sports. And, and that was 87. And then fast forward to 1990 is when they started uh, Extra Sports 690. And then, as you chronicled uh, at the beginning, a legendary station. I mean, from, uh, you know, John Ireland, Steve Mason were, uh, were on that uh, station at a time. Uh, Lee Hacksaw Hamilton, Steve Hartman, Chet Forty. When Chet passed away, they brought in Bill Werndell. Jim Rome got his start there. Uh, I got my start there. And in 1990, mm. I started doing a high school sports show on Saturday mornings. It was very popular. We moved it to 1991 at night. And it, it took off. And then in 1996, I got my first uh, full-time talk show. And, uh, you know, kind of the rest is history. We did a great job at 690 so well that uh, Clear Channel, uh, they decided to, to blow us all out in San Diego because uh, the, the station they had in L.A. couldn't beat us in the ratings. Sure. And so then Mr. Lynch's uh, opportunity to get back in the radio business in uh, early 2003 put us back to work at 1090. And, and the rest is history. But uh, really, John Lynch was the one that, uh, mm. senior is the one that got me into this business. And, you know, I told him when I took that job in 1987, Alan, I'd do it for one year. And little did I know that uh, things would take off for me. And I'd be here in uh, 2024, uh, still uh, out in the public eye talking sports. Well, it's funny, Coach, because, you know, I, listen, uh, and, and I think the listeners that we have that are, are listening to this right now, they probably don't have some of these. There's a lot of Laker fans, as you know, coach, that are, it's not just, it's not just targeted towards Southern California. There's Laker fans everywhere. They're across the country. They're across the world. And I think they have a little bit of history because that's, that's how I got started, you know, for, so it, it's, it's, I got started in sports talk radio. Um, you know, I know for me, it was more late this 2002 is when I did my first internship then I ended up getting a job at Mighty 1090. And it's funny when you talk about John Lynch, because for some reason, you know, I'm 21, 22 years old. Uh, my relationship with John Lynch, who was starting Mighty 1090, was excellent. And here was somebody that was actually pushing me more towards the sales side. And, you know, as you know, Coach, I was I sold for a number of years down in San Diego, the sponsorships, and I did it up in L.A. for 10 years. But some of the things that you were talking about with John Lynch, um, where he kind of helped open the door, he did the same for me. I'm sure he did the, the same for many people that are either in the L.A. market or in the San Diego market. Um, but obviously uh, a, a pioneer in the sports talk radio industry. And uh, of course, John Lynch Sr., the father, like you mentioned, of John Lynch Jr., who's the general manager of the uh, San Francisco 49ers. Um Okay, let me ask you this. Um, Lakers basketball, when did your connection with Lakers basketball, when did you start uh, following the team, and, and what, what was your draw and your interest to Lakers basketball? Well, uh, there was a local uh, gentleman that had played at San Diego High School. His name was John Fairchild. And John Fairchild uh, was kind of a late developer, Alan. Uh, he uh, didn't really get much of an opportunity. He was in junior high here in Solana Beach, playing at Earl Warren Junior High School. Then he went to San Diego and started to prosper, went to Palomar. Then he went to BYU, and he ended up with the Lakers in the 1965-66 mm. season. Okay, to this day, I have never met John Fairchild. But John Fairchild's father 
uh, worked in our community, used to stop by and have a beer every once in a while at my dad's bar, the Lucadian. And so my dad would always come home and tell me about John Fairchild. So we started watching Laker games in the 1965-66 season. And that wow. was the year they got beat, uh, you know, many times. Uh, they got By the Celtics? The they got beat by the Celtics. Mm -hmm. And that was what John Fairchild's only year he ever played for the Los Angeles Lakers. But because of John Fairchild having grown up in, in the community that I grew up in, I've been a Lakers fan. Elgin Baylor's always been my favorite Laker. I mean, I, I mean, I, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed watching him play. And the Lakers have had so many great players over the years, but Elgin always kind of stood out for me. But that, at seven years old, I became a Lakers fan. I'm 65 now. And, uh, I, I take these Laker basketball games probably a little bit more serious than I should. But uh, my wife said she, uh, she goes all the different sports, whether it's the Padres and, you know, I like watching obviously San Diego State and UCLA basketball. She goes, man, when the Lakers are on, you're just become a different guy because <laughs> I mean, every possession is critical. I mean, sure. every possession is critical. And you're going back to last night's game. You know, if they'd have lost that game, they they gave uh, Golden State plenty of opportunities to win those games in regulation and the first overtime and even the second overtime. And, I mean, it would have been devastating. That, that would have really put the kibosh on would have been a really, really nice day for me. But, man, they get that one-point win. I went to bed last night with a smile on my face. That was a hell of a win last night. Well, I, I, love, I love the history of kind of how you became a Laker fan because – you know, as somebody who also grew up in San Diego, I'm a Laker fan as well. And I think some people might think, well, that's weird. Why, why would you? There's a lot of Laker fans who are in San Diego. Oh, and absolutely. I think, and I think that has actually just something to do with the, the power of the brand of the Lakers. But um, the the kind of the, the going back to and I think this will kind of draw us a little bit towards what we saw yesterday and what we've seen so far uh, with the Lakers this year. Um, let, let me, let me start off with this because you have got a chance to see such amazing players. It's one of the reasons why I love doing the pregame show with Michael Thompson. Michael Thompson can sit here and tell you about Wilt Chamberlain and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Magic Johnson and, you know, go down the list of all the greats that he's watched over the years and your love and passion for the NBA, your love and passion for uh, Lakers basketball. LeBron is 39 years old. Yesterday, he had a stat line, and I'm trying to think off the top of my head. I think it was 36, 20, and 12. LeBron at age 39 years old is still doing what he's doing. Of all the greats that you've seen, and I'm not here to try to compare this player to that player. Who's, you know, is he the GOAT? Is he that? That, that part I'm not, uh, I'm not all that interested in, but Braun is still doing it at this stage of his career, and last night he's basically winning games on the road for the Lakers. What what is what when you think of LeBron James and and you look at some of the other greats that you've watched over the years? What 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 is your opinion, your thoughts on what you're watching from a 39 year old right now? Well, uh, there, there's a lot to talk about. Um, you know, I know everybody likes to compare Jordan and, and James or James and Jordan, you know, however you want to do it. I will tell you this, and maybe it's because I'm a Laker fan, okay? Uh, and I was never, you know, really into Michael Jordan because I've never been a North Carolina fan, either, I might add, with, you know, of course, UCLA. Um I, I, I enjoy watching LeBron play a lot more than I did Michael Jordan because I, I think he does more. And, you know, I think Jordan, you got to give Jordan credit. I mean, he won all the championships. He hit big shots. He was an incredible defender. I think he's a better defender than Le LeBron has been in his career. But, you know, the way he – I mean, look at some of those passes he made last night. I mean, they were incredible. Mm -hmm. That one bounce pass, he, he uh, had his back uh, to their uh, – uh, uh, sideline, and he snapped that bounce pass all the way across court for an easy layup. I mean, the there were so many, yeah, the deal. It was unbelievable. Um, I don't know. I just enjoy watching him play. You know, the thing that was amazing last night, Alan, that that's the career high for him in rebounds was 20. I mean, I would have thought somewhere along the line he'd have right. had you know a 20 plus rebound game, but that, that's pretty amazing. But I, I, I'll tell you this, I enjoy watching him play what he's doing at uh. 
29, 39. Who knows? This guy may try to play to 49. I mean, he's incredible. I mean, just incredible. And you know what? He continues to try to get better. I mean, last night, his three-point shot was going down. And there's some nights where he's off on the three-pointer, and he'll keep casting off, and I'm kind of yelling at the TV. I'm with you. Last night, I thought he played a heck of a basketball game. And, you know, I am – I'll be honest with you, and I don't want to get off track here because I know you want to – get more into the game but you go anywhere you want to go well i'm a little concerned about all those minutes last night for all those guys because now Mm -hmm. if i'm correct and correct me if i'm wrong they've got five games in the next eight days and they've got back-to-back starting tomorrow night uh in houston and uh boy uh, uh, they may have won the battle last night i just hope they don't lose the war on this road trip because uh you know we we don't know about anthony davis i mean he was limping around out there last night uh uh uh, Vanderbilt uh, twisted that ankle, and he was able yeah. to continue to play, but we don't know how stiff and sore that's going to be today. Well, it's, it's a good point, Coach. It, and Actually, it's probably not talked about enough, right, that it's an overtime game. Um, Braun plays 48 minutes. Think about that. for He played 48 minutes yesterday, and, when, and we almost leave that out of the stats just because we're paying such close attention to his production. AD still plays 45, even though he leaves the game with some type of hip issue that he said he'll be all right uh, after the game. Um, Vando is another good example, is another player that's been in and out of the lineup. They, you know, they're they're an interesting team. There were moments in that game yesterday where I thought they're going to lose. There are moments in that game that I thought yesterday, okay, this game's over, Lakers handled business. And there it goes, just here's an extra five minutes, here's an extra 10 minutes. And there, there really isn't margin for error. If they'd have lost that game yesterday, you're, I mean, look, they're still hovering around ninth or 10th spot. Um, you, you got teams like the Houston Rockets and the Golden State Warriors that are right behind them. The, I think it's a good point of the, that, that's, I, I think one of the things that's been brought up the most is how are they only one game over 500 where Braun and Anthony Davis have been this available for them? And I think it's a fair concern. Well, I think it's a fair concern, but I also uh, got a lot of confidence that this team can uh, ratchet it up when they have to. Uh, I mean, they're they're two and one uh, this year so far against the Clippers. Clippers are one of the best basketball teams in the in the league right now, and you know I know they got beat earlier in the week by the Clippers, but you know in in a, in a playoff t- type uh, atmosphere, you know I, I give the Lakers a good opportunity. Uh, guys like Anthony Davis. And LeBron James, they they can rise to the occasion. They got to get the other guys to buy in. Now, we'll tell you this, a couple of things. Number one, Vanderbilt's playing well. Now, we know, Alan, we know that he's offensively challenged, okay? And hopefully he continues to work on that open uh, three-pointer along the baseline because he's going to be having they're gonna a give lot it to of him. opportunity. Oh, absolutely. They're yeah. going to give it to him. And he wonders why he's open. Well, he's open because they want him to shoot. And he got. I know he's been working hard from what I understand in practice on that. Uh, but he played a fantastic game last night. I mean, a fantastic game defensively, getting his hands on a lot of different passes. But the one guy, and he played well last night, just didn't play a whole lot, is Rui Hachimura. Uh, I know he took a hard fall in that game last night. Hopefully he's not too uh, sore today. But they're going to have to find a way. Darvin Ham, in the next couple of games, he's going to have to find a way to steal some minutes for some guys on that bench to give some of his starters an opportunity to – to rest, even if you know you're going to call a timeout in like a minute and a half, get a guy out, let him rest over there for a couple of possessions, get that extra uh, minute or two during the timeout, and 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 get these guys all uh, you know an opportunity to play. It'll keep everybody sharp and keep those starters fresher. Coach, what what have you um, what have you just because you brought up Darvin Ham, and I, I I want to get your thoughts on on. Um, a couple things, how dangerous you think the team can be, what they should do at the trade deadline. But let, let's, you mentioned Darvin Ham. What do you think? What, what, what do you think of how he's um, juggled this lineup? What do you think of how he's juggled some of the personalities, the head coaching job of being the, the uh, driving the, the bus for a team that is the Los Angeles Lakers? What have you thought of coach? Well, first of all, I like him a great deal, Alan. Um, I think he's a good guy. I think he's a very, very knowledgeable basketball coach. Uh, there have been times, and I realize with LeBron James, uh, you probably uh, uh, it's probably an interesting dynamic that we're all not even really aware of. 
uh, and you see uh, LeBron in the huddle. And I think, you know, Darvin Ham gives uh, a lot of autonomy to LeBron, and I think he should, and, and as long as it's a good working relationship. But there have been times this year where I wasn't sure Darvin Ham was going to make it. I mean, there were some pretty ugly losses. Uh, that one uh, after on the back-to-backs, remember they, they played on a Wednesday and they played on a Friday and got beat by San Antonio when it snapped San Antonio. Oh, yeah. Losing streak. That, that game there did not sit well with me at all. And I started to kind of wonder if the Lakers were thinking about going a different way. Well, now they've kind of recouped. Uh, they still got a lot of work to do, obviously. Uh, in this road trip, they still got five games to go, we mentioned, in eight days. And they got to get some wins on this road trip. They can't come back as an under 500 ball club. But as far as Darvin Ham, there's times when I would like to see him maybe be a little bit firmer as a head coach. Uh, I realize he's got a lot of veterans on this team, and you, you coach veterans a lot different than you coach a younger team. But there's some, even last night, I mean, there's some times where I think he needs to bite down on some of these guys because they made a lot of mistakes at the end of the game last night, and especially in the two overtimes. They should have closed the game out in the first overtime, and they finally were able to get that call on LeBron going to the basket, which was by far, I mean, he got beat up going to the basket, and luckily mm -hmm. he was able to knock down those free throws. But, you know, they allowed Golden State to get back in that game a couple of different times after that great comeback the Lakers made. But I just like at times to see him be a little bit firmer with this squad. It's interesting, Coach, because I, I think – you brought up something, and and there's a lot of Laker fans, and I get it. This is this comes with the territory. It doesn't matter what team it is. When things are going well, you usually praise the players. When things aren't going well, you usually criticize the coach, and and that's kind of Darvin Ham's role with the Lakers. And it is what it is. That that comes with the territory. But I, I thought you know yesterday was a really good example, and I think this is going to lead me to um, my next question. But yesterday was a good example. Uh, am I watching a good Lakers team or am I watching two very average teams battle it out to see who's more average? And yeah. I thought the game was entertaining. I thought Steph Curry still, I mean, it's still incredible to see Steph Curry and LeBron James still doing what they're doing at such elite levels. I mean, Steph, just some unbelievable shots. Everybody knows the guy is looking to get a three off yet. He still finds a way to do it. Clutch moments. Clay had a couple of cl clutch moments. And then Braun, I don't need to explain, you know, what he was able to do. But you said something a little bit earlier, and I, I feel like there are a lot of people that lean more towards what you said. I, is this still a very dangerous team? You think just get in the playoffs. Once you're in the playoffs, it's a seven-game set. The structure is differently. I think it favors the Lakers more because you get some more rest in between. It favors a guy like LeBron James or – is this just a team that's exactly what their record is, average? Well, you know, uh, Alan, that's a good question because I'm going to tell you, you know, Lakers uh, have really been incredible. I think they're in the top five, and uh, you look at those numbers a lot more than I do. I think they're in the top five as far as uh, uh, fast break points this year, okay? Come playoff time, it becomes a half-court game. And that pick and roll with guys like LeBron James and Anthony Davis, I don't care how much you practice for, those guys are big, strong, and powerful and talented. And I think the Lakers match up uh, in the playoffs better than they do in the regular season, even though they're really taking advantage of getting out on the break. I mean, LeBron, at 39 years of age, man, he, it's amazing. He gets that rebound or gets that pass after a quick rebound, and he just pushes that thing up the court. And that, that's Laker basketball right now. But come playoff time, you know, you've watched it all for years and years. Uh, you don't get those opportunities in the playoffs very well to, to get the running game going. When you do, it's great. More times than not, you're going to probably win a playoff game, but it comes down to being able to execute your offense. And, you know, I, I'll tell you something. D'Angelo Russell, when he was originally drafted by the Lakers, I, I wasn't a big fan. I wasn't a big fan at all, but I'll tell you what, I'm a big fan of him right now because mm. I really think his game over the years he's been in the NBA, and he's made a few different stops along the way. Uh, it, it's really gotten a whole lot better. And and I know his name has been thrown out there in trade rumor after trade rumor. But I'll tell you what, if they do trade him, they better get a, a sharpshooter in return because right now he's playing, I think, fantastic basketball. Yeah, it's it's, it's that it was going to take me. I was going to eventually bring up D'Angelo Russell. So all the chatter around D'Lo, um, and a lot of it probably also has to do with that playoff run that the Lakers were in last year. And, and he just wasn't effective in the series against Denver. 
How much do you think if if and, and this is just more we don't know until we're back in the playoffs. If he's on this roster by the time February eighth rolls around, then he's going to clearly be a part of the playoff run. Sounds like you got a lot of confidence that second go around doing it again with the Lakers and get another opportunity. You you at least it sounds like you have some optimism towards that. Oh, absolutely. Let's remember last year. I mean, Darvin Ham was running guys in and out and trying to go with the hot guy. And, you know, he didn't play well at the beginning of that series. All of a sudden, he got a lot of pine time. He was over there sipping on Gatorade and, and cheering his mates on. Um, I, the guy's a tremendous shooter. I mean, go back to last night's game. I mean, he made two uh, turnovers Credit. in crunch time. Yeah. And, and then he came down and he pulled up. Uh, it was uh one on two one on two two defenders and and D'Lo and he pulls up and knocks down that three-pointer you know what most guys they, they had been hesitant after two bad ugly turnovers in a row I mean there's no way they would have taken that shot they would have thought if they took that shot and missed it'd be over on the the sidelines you know what nothing but string music huge shot and it said a lot about who he is and the type of confidence he has in his game right now it's a good point. I mean, I, I know Doris Burke was saying that on the broadcast yesterday that he's got the nerve to throw two turnovers, basically potentially cost the Lakers the game and still pull up and take that three. Cause you know that coach, you know that that, that shot doesn't go in. Um, that's probably your ball game. And we're talking about D making a couple critical mistakes and taking a bad shot. Instead, he ends up with 28 points and a little bit of a hero ball there at the end. Um, I, it's it's funny because the trade deadline is the trade deadline, and that's going to come and go. And I think the question mark for the Lakers is there's the short term and then there's the long term. Are you just, just addressing things short term? And, and can you accomplish both? And I think that's going to have something to do with D'Angelo Russell. And if they do end up trading him, I'm assuming that there's also a long term element that's in play. But one of the other, I think you could look at the future for the Lakers. If I'd have told you before the season started, how do you feel about Anthony Davis being the head of the snake for this Lakers franchise? Watching what he's done this year, he's played coach in 45 of 47 games. Last night was a great example to see that also somebody that is a gamer. He's kind of playing through injuries. I know you could have some concern there as well because he's putting in so many minutes um, and there's still so much basketball left to go. But how have you thought Anthony Davis has taken on the burden of, at, at least especially I think more focused on this year, of being a Laker and understanding that this franchise at some point the key's got to come to him? What have you thought of Anthony Davis so far this year? Well, I think he's been outstanding this year, Alan. And I think uh, when they originally brought him in from New Orleans, I, I thought uh, he was supposed to be the number one banana uh, and LeBron would, you know, uh, you know, work uh, things towards him. And, you know, at times it's been like that. I think in the championship run uh, in, the, in the COVID season, uh, it worked out that way. I mean, Anthony Davis in the playoffs has showed up. I mean, there's no question about that. Yeah, keeping him on the floor, that's been another uh, factor. And I, I also think that he's heard the fans and he's heard a lot of the – um, uh, the Anthony Davis uh, chat that the guy, you know, is a, uh, soft and he can't uh, play, uh, you know, 70 games a year or 75 games a year. And I think he's trying to prove people wrong. I mean, that effort last night coming back, I didn't think we were going to see him. I didn't even know he'd come back on the bench. And the next thing I'm you with know, you. He's back in the game. And at the end of the night, man, when you look at his numbers last night, wow. They, they jumped out at you. I mean, LeBron and, and Steph Curry, of course, had the, the incredible numbers. But Anthony, for what he did last night and, and the time that he missed, I mean, he went out in a critical situation in that basketball game and still ended up with 29 points and double digit and rebounds. And he's such a force on defense. He's playing the way the Lakers thought he could play back when they made that trade many years ago with New Orleans. And, you know, you ask about short-term, long-term. Hey, if, if you're the Lakers, you're Laker fans, we don't care about long term. Let's worry about winning a championship this year, win that championship, and then we'll go back to work and figure out how we can win another one next year. Well, and, and coach, they're one of the few franchise few franchises that have that luxury, right? They're one of the few franchises that their rebuild is a lot different than a lot of other rebuilds. If you're the Oklahoma City Thunder, you better be drafting right, you better be developing right, and you better have a five year process. The Lakers they can skip that process. Obviously, they're always an attractive destination. 
the brand is the brand, but you're right about that. And it's a good perspective to have that um, they can go all in all the time. And and by the way, you got to go all in when LeBron's 39 years old. It's not like you're really thinking three, four years down the road. But it'll be interesting how uh, how some of that plays out. And, um, and certainly, I think some of that AD chatter, whatever the chatter has been in the past, there cannot be a Laker fan that has com- that has complained about Anthony Davis this year because I think he's been excellent. Obviously, has found a way to uh, contribute night in night out and and be available for the Lakers. Um, okay, Coach, I got one more question on the Laker front, and then I got uh, a question for you on the baseball front as well. Okay, um, okay for the Lakers, we got about. Um, we're about let's say two weeks away or so from the about three weeks away from the all-star break. What do you, what, what's most important to you between now and the all-star break? And then, you know, assuming that this is the roster that the Lakers have players that you feel like got to do more um, players that you feel like are, uh, I guess you can call it. And maybe it's one of the names that you've already mentioned in Rui Hachimura. I, I'm just curious, what guys do you feel like have to step up more and also, what, what do you think this team is going to be the rest of the way? Well, uh, number one, I hope they can stay healthy. And, and again, I am concerned after that long double overtime win last night, you know, having to play uh, five games in eight days. And uh, they start with uh, back-to-backs on Monday and Tuesday. Uh, Monday night, of course, they got uh, Houston. And I think they got Charlotte, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in, the, in the second game there, Alan. But uh, it's going to be a tough road trip. There's no question about that. I want to see them have a winning road trip. I mean, I guess worst case scenario, go three and three, but I'd like to see him, you know, go four and two. I mean, you'd love five and one, but uh, I'll take a four and two road trip as bad as the Lakers have been on the road all year long. I mean, that was only their seventh win on the road last year. What are they, seven and 15 now? Seven and Uh, 15, yep. Yeah, so hopefully they're able to, you know, rebound. Uh, You know, I'd like to see Christian Wood get an opportunity to play Mm. a little bit more. I think he's played well at times. And again, I think Darvin and his staff are going to have to find a way to get some of these guys that aren't getting a lot of minutes. Max uh, Christie, he's not been playing all that bad. I'd get him a little bit uh, uh, in there. And, of course, uh, Hotcher Mira, I'm, I'm a little confused on why he's not playing a whole lot more. I mean, I realize Vanderbilt's playing great defense, but Hotcher Mira is going to give you a lot more on the offensive end. I think, you know, you keep uh, playing him. Uh, what did he get, 19 minutes last night? That's not a whole lot in a double overtime. And I don't think he missed a shot last night. Uh, I like him. I, I think he's a good player, and I think he's been underutilized. So I'd like to see that bench just be a little bit longer. And if they are going to go out and, and try to make a deal, I would hope uh, D'Lo wouldn't be a part of that, first of all. Uh, I still think they need another guy that can consistently shoot because Torian Prince has been pretty much up and down. Yeah, the, and, and some of those minutes, if you're going to get Rui some more time or Christian Wood, probably going to come from Torian Prince, which is fine. Um, and I think, you know, it might be game to game. Like you said, coach, there's going to be games where if an Austin Reeves is struggling, maybe he's playing a little bit less. If, uh, just use it for any of these guys, Tony and Prince, if Christian Wood or Rui Hachimura are having good games, kind of ride that wave a little bit. I don't feel like the Lakers do that enough. Um, okay. So on the Lakers front coach, uh, I I appreciate your insight on all that stuff. And I'm sure a lot of Laker fans do as well. One baseball question for you now. Um, you and I are unique because we are Laker fans who also are San Diego Padre fans, Uh which you could imagine that this channel, um, has a lot of, uh, Dodger fans just simply because of, uh, uh, Dodgers baseball and the connection with the Lakers. Um, how does anybody stop the Los Angeles Dodgers this year? And I, I know that's a very generic question, but. Um, this isn't, you know, you and I might have fandom towards the Padres, but the storyline in the off season was the Los Angeles Dodgers and the fact that they got Shohei and they got Yamamoto and, um, there's just, uh, they already have all the talent that they have. How does anybody stop the Los Angeles Dodgers this year? I'm curious just to get your thoughts on what they did this off season, adding on top of to a, a team that already had a hundred wins in the, in the, uh, in last year. Well, first of all, Alan, uh, the very first uh, high school athlete I ever interviewed back in 1987 for the Bloomin' Harrigan 
uh, pregame tailgate talk show for the San Diego Chargers was a sophomore quarterback from Rancho Buena Vista High School by the name of Dave Roberts. Hmm. And I interviewed him and his high school coach, Craig Bell. And, and the way it went, Craig Bell, uh, I knew because he had coached at San Diego and I wanted to start. I was a rookie, you know, I'd take my little tape recorder out there. And I said to Coach Bell, I go, I want to interview you and I need to interview one of your uh, football players. And so I went out and interviewed Coach Bell. He took me over to the gym. And there was this little uh, 15 year old uh, kid by the name of Dave Roberts. And <laughs> oh, I man. sat down and interviewed him. Dave and I have been uh, friends ever since. And uh, I got great respect for Dave Roberts. I, I mean, I could go on. There's a whole history between Dave and I, but I'm not going to get into that right now. But I love the guy. He's a great guy. And the Dodgers are very fortunate to have him uh, in their organization, let alone being the skipper of their ball club. Uh, the only uh, team that's going to stop the Los Angeles Dodgers this year are going to be the Los Angeles Dodgers. Uh, you know, I, I was telling somebody the other day, the only question regarding the Dodgers during the regular season, are they going to win 100, 105, 110, or 115? I mean, uh, let, let's face it, the Dodgers, like the Lakers, they could go, Dodgers go 162 and 0. Lakers could go 82 and 0. Would still, uh, if you're a Dodger Laker fan, you'd still be uh, di dissecting every game because uh, they didn't sure. win enough and they didn't win by enough. Uh, mm -hmm. But Dodgers going to be tough. Uh, you know, the worst kept secret in sports the last year or two was that Otani was going to go to the Dodgers. Mm -hmm. uh, I know they going back to the days when they were uh, uh, scouting him in Japan. I mean, they were all over him. Uh, they, I remember one time they, they took Oral Hershiser and a whole group of people over there to watch him play. Uh, so this was not a surprise to me uh, in any way, shape, or form. The thing that uh, surprised me a little bit was that Saturday when they said he was on a plane to Toronto. I go, you got to be kidding me. He's going to sign with the Toronto Blue Jays, and he was sitting at home with his dog uh, in Orange County. But Dodgers are going to be tough. And like I said, the only uh, team that's going to stop the Dodgers this year, whether it's in the regular season or postseason, will be the Dodgers. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's it's probably the best way to put it. I mean, the talent is there, but it, you know, in, we've seen it in baseball. You can have potentially the best roster out there. Once the playoffs start, what are you able to put together? The Diamondbacks represented the NL this year in the World Series. Um, obviously, uh, uh, a, a year ago, it was the Padres beating the Dodgers. But it seems like if you thought the Dodgers were next level for the last ten years, as far as what their roster goes. Who would have thought they can multiply by X amount? And I feel it feels like they did that this offseason. We'll see how things play out, but that's probably the best way to put it. One of these days, you'll have to give us some of those Dave Roberts stories because at, at least I will tell you this in LA, as somebody, you know, doing my do the radio show as well on 710 ESPN, um, a lot of Dodger fans would like to see the organization move on from Dave Roberts. They point the finger at Dave Roberts. What do you think? Fair, unfair? How 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 would you um how would you view the the Dodger fans out there that would like to move on from him? Well, I, I don't know if you can really pinpoint any one thing that Dave has done that would uh, force his dismissal. I think a lot of the things in the postseason, uh, I think a lot of those uh, decisions have been made by the organization. I think Dave does an incredible job of, of keeping his players happy. They they all seem to uh, sing his praises. I mean, if you're if you're managing a ball club and, and guys like Mookie Betts or Freddie Freeman, uh, uh, if they don't like you, they're going to let the front office know. And obviously, he's pushing the right buttons during the regular season. Uh, to me, I think uh, the uh, the analytics have taken over a little bit too much in the postseason. They made a lot of bad moves pitching wise, and I'm not necessarily sure those are Dave Roberts' moves. I think those made the moves were made even prior to the ball game starting that night. Yeah, that's a uh, that's today's world, and um, probably more so in baseball than anything else. But of course, the analytics they're they're in there in the NFL, they're in there in the NBA, and I don't think they're going anywhere. Um, Coach, a pleasure. You know, my brother. You know uh, um, how much I appreciate you taking the time to uh, to join here, and um, you do a fantastic job. Obviously, talking all sports, but I wanted to make sure that we got uh, your voice in here to talk uh, Lakers basketball. I know how much uh, you enjoy the game of the NBA, how much you enjoy Lakers basketball, and your insight is uh, fantastic. So thank you very much for uh, for taking the time. Well, Alan, I'll, uh, thank you, and uh, it was always a lot of fun working with you. Uh, 
Uh, the Cantera family, uh, from my daughters to my wife, always have, uh, whenever your name has been mentioned, there's always a smile on their face. A lot of great memories. You're a great guy, hardworking guy, honest guy. And, uh, you know, I, I can't say enough of nice things about you. And appreciate you having me on and look forward to doing it again. See, see Coach, we, we came full circle here. There's a time I used to call into your show every once in a while, and now I'm asking you, hey, Coach, do you have some time to come uh, join me on my show? So, uh, it's, uh, it, it is for a circle. Well, I appreciate it. And, uh, for those who are tuning in right now, uh, coach John Cantera, legendary broadcaster. I hope you guys were able to, if you didn't know coach before, I hope you know him now. And, uh, obviously some great Lakers insight. This was hoops talk weekly episode number three. Thank you very much for tuning in guys. Very much. Uh, appreciate it.